Good evening, friends. It is so good to see you all here tonight. Uh, it feels like a bit of a family reunion. My name is Grant Beckwith. I'm the head of school, and it's my privilege to conduct tonight's uh, back-to-school all-parent meeting. This is a required meeting. We, we will be recording it. We're going to start on time. Uh, we can, we're going to try and keep this to an hour if we can. We might go just a little longer, but welcome. Thank you for being here, making the sacrifice. This is important. This is our children we're talking about. Let's go ahead and begin by singing our school song, Children of Liberty. Uh, we will ask you to stand for that. We've got the words right here. Many of you may not know it. Uh, our... Uh, School song will be conducted by Jenny Burr, member of our parent organization presidency, and Stan Swim at the piano. You're going to hear from Stan a little bit later tonight. He's a man of many talents. So Children of Liberty, following which our invocation will be offered by Dan Burton. He's one of our members of the Board of Trustees. Thank you, Dan. And then our Pledge of Allegiance will be conducted by Rob Homestead. He's the husband of one of our members of the Board of Trustees, Katie Homestead. So Children of Liberty. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful to be here this evening. We are grateful to be associated with this great school. We're thankful for the efforts of all those who contribute to the mission and the accomplishment of the mission of our school. We're grateful for Mr. Beckwith and his great leadership. We're thankful for the other administrators who work with him for each of the faculty members, the teachers, who guide our children and teach them and help them to grow and develop. We are grateful for those who have been so generous to make this school possible, to donate their time and their resources and their talents to building this remarkable institution. We pray for all those who will participate this evening, that they will be blessed with the ability to convey the message that they have prepared. Pray that we will be ready to hear these messages and understand what we can do as parents to contribute to the mission of the school and the betterment of each of the students here at the school. We thank thee again for the opportunity to be associated with one another and to be a part of this great school. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. If you will please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. 
Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are you ready for this? Are we ready to get back into this school year? <laughs> Some of you are clapping. Want to get back to routines. Some of you want to go back to sleep. Summer goes on for another month, right? We're ready, and we are very excited. It's been a very eventful summer. We'll talk about that a little bit tonight. But first, we're going to hear from our parent organization president, Jill Murdoch, uh, following which we will hear from our chairman of the board of trustees, uh, Bob Sorensen. He'll share some remarks, introduce our other members of the Board of Trustees. Uh, we will excuse Bob shortly after he delivers his remarks. He has a family reunion going on right now uh, with family showing up at his home and he's not there. So he will speak and run and then he'll watch the video. Right, Bob? <laughs> okay. Jill Murdoch and then Bob Sorensen. Hello, my friends. Here we go again. A few years ago, when I was first asked to be parent organization president, I remember meeting in the North Auditorium and having empty seats still. I am so impressed with this group and even more coming in. I think we're going through another growth spurt of sorts. We want to welcome each and every one of you to this exciting new school year. The parent organization um, helps with over more than 30 events that happen here at the school. Anywhere from the book fair to the teddy bear project to lost and found to lunchroom. And this year we have added on two team leaders for other events that happen this year. One of them is which we're going to call the athletic booster. This team leader, which happens to be Jody Nielsen, will be helping the volunteers help run our sporting events. And the other new team leader that we have for this next year is the awards ceremony. And they will be putting together all the information and awards that happen at the end of the school year. Um, before we get too far, I'd like to introduce my presidency. I feel so lucky and blessed that they stayed on with me again this year. But we have Jenny Burr, who's one of my vice presidents, Teresa Despain, who is a vice president, and Andrea Monfredi, who's a vice president, and Melissa Washburn, who is the secretary um, with the presidency. These are fabulous women, and I am so grateful for them. Yeah. Okay. The volunteer sign-up sheets for the events will be out on the tables after this meeting, so feel free to roam them, and some of the team leaders will be there along with the president organ organization presidency to help answer any questions that might help you match up events that can help with your family's lifestyle and needs. Feel free to ask us any questions that you may have. Um, just to let you know, as each event approaches, you will be contacted by the team leader to see if that event will still work um, with your schedule and if you're still able to help out with that. Um, we want to also let you know that we have a couple of vacancies for team leaders that we need filled one of which is field day, and another one is geography, geography B, and the last team leader we need is for drama and musical. In fact, drama and musical has auditions this Friday and Saturday, and so we are really looking for somebody to even help out with the auditions this Friday and Saturday. Um, as many as you know, at the beginning of the school year, we have one of our biggest events, which is called Fall Festival. We need many, 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 many hands for that event to help make it a fun success because it is always fun. So feel free to sign up on one of the blanks on the volunteer sheet out there. Also, there's a table out there for room volunteer parents. Some of the um, teachers have three room parents. One volunteer helps to organize um, the things that they need for grading or checking papers. Another room parent is the event parent, which handles the field trips and special occasions. And another volunteer parent is for over the holidays and parties and celebrations in there. Um, just to also let you know, lunchroom always needs lots of mini hands to help it work out. We still need more help with food handlers permit. You can obtain that online through Edline. 
And once again, the school will reimburse you for that. And if we figured out, some, well, somebody figured out, sat down and figured out, if one family, if each family took a day to help in the lunchroom, then the lunchroom would be completely covered for the entire school year. And all you would have to do is one day of volunteer. And that would be a fabulous blessing to all of us and even to you because then you get a chance to see your children eat lunch with them and help out there. So it's only a 45 minute shift and we'd really like to have many more people help out with that. Our first parent organization meeting is coming up on September 4th at 8.30 in the morning. This is going to be a really fabulous time. We have um, some parents who are going to share with us how they have been inspired by the mission statement to be able to fulfill their volunteer hours here at school. Whether it's moms with kids in tow or how do you can do volunteer hours from home. One will even share how they, how they fulfill their volunteer hours while living in a different state. So these are gonna be some great experiences that you can learn from or share or may help you in being able to fulfill your volunteer hours here at the school. Um, tomorrow, also to let you know, is the uniform swap. It's from 12 to three in the lunchroom. Be sure to bring lots of checks because you will need to be writing individual checks out for each person that you purchase uniform pieces from. Um, oh, also at that parent meeting, I need to make sure that any room parents that sign up and volunteer, there will also be a short training at that meeting, so you will need to attend that meeting also. Just to let you know regarding carpool, if you're interested in carpooling, um, there is a link once you sign in to Edline on the home webpage, it's called Carpool Information, and it will list all the cities in alphabetical order and all the families, and you are more than welcome to go through that and contact families and let them know that you are interested to carpool. Um, the parent orientation meeting is coming up, always the beginning of the school year, and that will be Wednesday, August 28th. We really ask that at least one parent needs to attend that meeting. This is really imperative for you to be able to sit in your child's classroom, meet with their teacher, understand what will be happening in their classroom, what some of their regulations and guidelines are and how you can help from home. So please plan on one parent attending that parent orientation meeting on August 28th. And then for all your service hours this year, normally we've had a binder in the front office that you go and sign your hours in. We are switching everything to online. So last year, if you weren't entering your volunteer hours online, then this year you get to everything will be done online. Now, thanks, many applause to Tammy Morse. I had her, she, yeah, she totally does. She needs it. She created a quick link for you on the front page of the webpage where you can just scroll to the bottom and it says family service hours. Click on that, it will take you into Edline lickety split and you can enter your volunteer hours right away. So that is a really quick link for you to be able to do that. Anyway, we wanted to wish you all a very fun year full of treasured memories and we hope to see you at all the events. Thank you. Thank you, Grant. Thank you, Jill. If we could have Curtis Minor, I saw him walk in, stand up. Curtis has served in our board and he was the past uh, chairman of the board. It is thrilling to see you here. We love Curtis. No one misses Curtis more than Bob Sorensen. <laughs> All board members that are here, if you could please stand. We have Dan Burton. This is his first year on the board. Jeff, Dr. Jeff Matthews, Jill Bigelow. It's wonderful to see you. There's three. We have Katie Homestead, Mary Kay Ware, and Clayton Chun. It's Clayton's first year on the board, and we're thrilled to have him. Let's make Clayton feel at home. Aloha. Aloha. Clayton served in the public education system in Hawaii for 35 years and brings a tremendous uh, amount of knowledge and expertise. I am thrilled to be a patron of American heritage. This is my 22nd year. 22 years ago, dads, my wife approached me and she said, uh, Bob, I'd like for our, our second grader to attend American Heritage. And dads, guess what my first question was? Exactly, how much will that be? 
Today I told Grant, just think how much money I'd have if, if I'd saved all the money these last 22 years as my children have attended American Heritage. But this is the most important piece, and that is I've asked all my children as they've gone through and graduated and moved on from American Heritage, would they rather have the money or their American Heritage experience? Every one of them would want to have, again, the American Heritage experience in their life. And I'm grateful for that. And so as a dad, I think I've done okay. So good job, dads. I know that frequently moms want you here. I, um, all the time, moms want you at American Heritage. I uh, want to relate a quick story, and then I'm going to head off to, actually, my daughter's getting married, and we have people coming from all over the, the country, flying in here and there. And so I want to get back to, to home. Thirteen years ago, my youngest, my oldest, my youngest son, Michael, he's a senior this year. He's gone all 13 years at American Heritage School, was about to come to American Heritage. I went to his room that evening, and uh, he was asleep, and next to his bed was my wife, my wonderful wife, I don't know if any of you know her, Robbie Ann, and she was on her knees, and she was sobbing and crying, and she was on her knees talking to Heavenly Father. You see, this was her little buddy. This was her last in the nest who was about to go out into the world of school. And um, I, I think that that is going to be repeated here Sunday night prior to Monday when your children come here. You'll go in their rooms and you'll look over them and you'll have a prayer in your hearts so that they'll have a magnificent experience. And I can tell you they will have a magnificent experience at American Heritage. I uh, am certain of that. I promise you that your children will be loved. I promise you that your children will be known I promise you that when they come home and you sit at the dinner table, you'll have conversations, not all the time, but from time to time, that'll just warm your heart, thrill your soul, make you feel overwhelmingly grateful for the experience your children are having at American Heritage. Thank you so much for coming to this meeting tonight. There are so many of you here. I believe this is our greatest turnout ever. And so uh, we appreciate your patronage Again, we promise you that your children are known and loved here at American Heritage. Thank you. Thank you, Bob and Jill. Uh, both of those individuals carry a great psychological weight on their shoulders. Um, and it's not easy to occupy the seats that they occupy. So we are very, very grateful for you, Jill, and for Bob, uh, and for each of the board members uh, who commit so much of their time, energy, and resources to this mission. Uh, it has been an eventful summer for many of us. We said goodbye to our beloved Trudy Ward Netto, 24 years assistant principal. We had a retirement celebration for her last week. And uh, goodbye to some of our well-loved teachers who will not be returning. We welcomed Debbie Hobbs, the new kindergarten through sixth grade assistant principal. Where is Debbie? Debbie, will you please stand? <laughs> Debbie has been <laughs> prepared for this for a long, long time. She's even from Idaho, just like Trudy. So don't be surprised if you think you're talking to Trudy when you're really talking to Debbie. We gave Blaine and Leland, Mr. Hunsaker and Mr. Anderson, uh, our two principals, we gave them slightly different titles. Again, uh, Mr. Anderson is now the principal over focusing on our distance education program. Uh, we're up to nearly 1,000 students in that program, 48 states, 23 countries, and we need a dedicated person there. And Mr. Hunsaker taking the principal role over kindergarten through 12th grade now. Uh, he will be the primary uh, decision maker and operator for the day-to-day -day programs and events at the school. Uh, we love and trust and respect all of these administrators. Thank you for accepting those assignments. Uh, we also welcome back a few of our experienced teachers uh, who have been here and been loved before. Nancy Morrill, Sharon Scanland, Corinne Vance. Maybe they can just raise their hands. They were here before and now they're back and we're so glad to have them back. If they're here, there's Sharon over there. Is Corinne here? 
uh, probably a good time just to say thank you to all of our teachers who do so much for our children. Let's just give them, if they're here, teachers, could you just stand if you're here? Okay, all of our teachers who are here, please. Until you've done it, until you've been a teacher, it's hard to comprehend how much goes into that job. Early mornings, late nights, tears, blood, literally, right? Playground. Uh, so teachers, we honor you. We know that you are the heart of our school. Uh, thank you. This summer, we also said goodbye to three members of our school community who were called home. Uh, Keaton Howard, and I think I saw Scott and Kimberly here. Thank you, Scott and Kimberly. The Keaton's Light uh, Memorial Book Fund has received many donations to our library for that and will continue to bless children for generations. Uh, we also said goodbye to Paxton Norton. Are, are Dave and Shannon here, the Nortons? Okay, there's, are, there, hi, Shannon. Uh, beautiful, beautiful little three-year-old boy. Uh, part of our school community, even though he never attended here. Camden will still be here, and the Nortons will still be here, and we love you and are grateful for the spirit that you bring to our school, and that Paxton did as well. Wonderful article on Deseret News about him. Uh, just Google it. Uh, and then also Lou Bankhead, uh, who was one of those who built this building, L&T Construction. He's a member of the swim, well, he's, he's the Bankhead, Larry, swim, Larry Bankhead Swim. That was Larry's brother. Uh, and so our hearts and prayers go out to each of these families, and we acknowledge their role. They are now all helping us from the other side of the veil. We know they are joining that team there uh, and rooting for us and gently guiding us. We do not underestimate those members of our school community and their help. Uh, also, we need to, just while we're thinking, could we have any of our administrative team who is not already, well, just the administrators, staff, uh, front office, angels, uh, could you please just stand? Uh, summers, it turns out, for any of our administrators, Summers are actually uh, longer and more intense than the school year uh, because we're trying to plan the whole universe, it seems like, in about 60 days, plus fill in vacations and everything else. Let's give all of our administrators a big round of applause for all of the work that they put in. Okay, you should have with you uh, from the front table, you should have an updated parent handbook. Uh, this is also online. Uh, you should have a summary of updated policies and reminders letter. This green document right here. Uh, I'll just, uh, actually I'll come back to this and call to your attention just a few things. We're not going to read this. Promise me that you will read this and I won't spend much time tonight on it. Can you do that? Just not, great, wonderful. Uh, you should have, um, well, let's see, did we have calendars on the table out there? probably because we wanted you to use the online calendar. That's why. We did put a calendar in your seating pack. It's a hard copy just for you to refer to. Please use the online calendar when you're planning vacations, work, travel, things like that. Occasionally we do modify the official school calendar. So please use the online version if you can. Uh, one note, um, tomorrow there's a clarification. Meet the teacher is from 1 to 3 and uniform swap is from 12 to 3. We did that so you can come and get uniform swapping done before Meet the Teacher if you want to. Um, and then Meet the Teacher is just open house. There's no program for Meet the Teacher. You just come and, and mingle and meet. And, uh, and, and so also the front office asked me to mention that the September and October pizza orders are due September 3rd. And pizza forms go home the first day of school. So you'll see those in backpacks, those abyss packpacks. Find it in there. Uh, for grades 1 through 6. Grades 7 through 12, they just bring money for pizza day. So, and the first pizza day will be September 9th. Okay? So that's from the front office. Self-directed study and the principal approach, that was not on the table, but if you did not receive that, that I should have brought a copy to show you. Uh, that is a workbook in our methodology published by the Foundation for American Christian Education. 
we give one of those to every new family at the school and expect you to read it. You even check off on your parent service hours log that you read it. It's one of the few required parent training items here, including foundations training, that you need to check off that you read it. For foundations training and for this meeting, we need you to get on that parent service log online and check off that you were here or watched them. Okay? So get that, that, that self-directed study from the library or the front office, new families, if you don't have it yet. Okay? Um, there is a parent and student orientation video that is, was created for new families. We showed it to all the new families on Monday at the new student orientation. We would like for all of the families in the school community to watch it. It's less than 15 minutes. It's on our homepage. Will you please go home with your students with your children and just watch that uh, before school starts. And then also, um, you all received an honor code in your seating letter packages for either elementary school students or middle and high school students or both if you have both. There is a statement, an honor code statement that needs to be signed and returned to their core classroom teacher by the end of the first week of school. Please take an opportunity to sit down with your child, read through those honor code standards and commitments, sign it together, your signature is required as well, and then send that to school. We will give a copy to your students, okay? So that's deliverables and paper. Did I miss anything, administrators, that was on the table that needs to be, okay. Uh, here's our agenda for tonight. We're going to talk just about a few updated policies. We're going to just mention a few things about what's new. We're going to talk about accreditation for just a minute. We'll do some security and child protection. We will have a presentation on the history from the perspective of two founding families. Some of you may have heard this before. It's important to hear it again. And so we do this at this meeting and at foundations training every year, twice a year. And we're very grateful to have uh, Stan Swim and Dr. Janet Erickson here to, to share that perspective with us tonight. Uh, and then also we will close by talking about some priorities for this year that is important that we all unify around. Uh, so why don't we uh, go ahead and just take a look at this for just a minute, this updated, uh, this letter updating, summarizing the updated policies. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but math advancement on the first page, grade 7 through 12, please note we will not be advancing children into the next math level if they are performing on a cumulative basis at the end of the year at a C- minus or below level. That, that's a... So, sorry, thank you, Mary Kay. C+, 79% or lower. Uh, that's a recommendation of Saxon Math, and we're a school that does not like to just pat people and move them along if they're not prepared. So please make a note of that. Um, and note that that's a higher standard than our academic probation standard, uh, which is uh, C minus or above. Okay? All right, on page two, service hours and parent training, there's the link for the new service and parent training log that we want you to just put those service hours and things online, that you've watched these videos for required meetings and training. Next one, immunization requirements. Please do not test us on this, on this legal requirement. If your child shows up to school on the first day and you do not have one of three things, either your immunization record an exemption form that you file with the Utah County Health Department, or, and here's the third one, you can show up on the first day of school with this, a, a note from the doctor, or an email from the doctor, or a call from the doctor, we can't just take your word for it, that you have a doctor's appointment set up to get those immunizations, then you can come back to school on day two. If not, we're going to have to ask your child not to come back to school until we have one of those three things, okay? So just a note there. Uh, page three, carpool procedures. Actually, we'll get to this in our safety and security section of tonight, so I'm just going to skip over that one. Um, students checking out early and closed campus policies. Please note this is a closed campus. Parents in seventh through twelfth grade, please do not ask us to check your student out for lunch. If you're checking them out for the rest of the day, that's fine. 
please do not call us and give your student permission to check out for lunch and come back, especially with driving students. This is really, uh, this is a common question that we answer. This is a closed campus. We've had many, many problems associated with parents checking students out just for lunch. I'm not going to go into all those problems. Just please don't do that to us. If you're going to check them out for the rest of the day, that's great. If you're checking them out for a uh, doctor's appointment, fine. Uh, but don't check them out just for lunch. Uh, this is a closed campus for that purpose. Okay, um, that's everything on updated policies. So uh, let's go ahead and just take a look at what's, what are some new things here in American Heritage this year. I'm gonna, does this work? Can you hear me okay or was the other one better? It, this one's better, okay. Um, you have this in a flyer that you have, that you've picked up at the front table, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but just wanted to let you know, distributed leadership is something that we're doing this year. There are now faculty department chairs who are helping us with this sixth principle of the American Christian government history and education principles that we study here of how the seed of local self-government is planted. Uh, this is a very important part of helping our administrative team as well. Do we have any of our department chairs who are here? Angie McIntyre, Julie Arnold, uh, Chris Culver, uh, science is, is it JoLynn Newman? Uh, okay. Laurie Updike for, for, for 7th through 12th grade, Rob Swenson in music. Uh, they will be helping this year. You may be hearing from them as department chairs, and we're very grateful for their help. Okay, we've got some other things that are new. Additional reading and math specialists, computer adaptive assessments. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, student portfolios in grade K through 2, robotics, new computers in the lab. Thank you. There were, some of you have donated for some of these things to happen, and we are so grateful for that. There are so many things that are done here as a result of your giving and sacrifice. Um, we will have an introduction to mobile device programming. We've got a few parents who do that professionally, and we'll be sharing some of that with us and our students. Science faculty mentors from BYU uh, for our science department. AP chemistry will be offered this year. Experiential learning, talk just a little bit more about that later. Some amplification systems and more home and distance education. Accreditation, just very briefly, we had a very successful visit in the spring. The Board of Governors of NWAIS will be making a decision about the school this fall um, we know that they want us in the association, that accreditation is virtually guaranteed. The question is, will there be some things that they want us to improve before they actually give us that? So it could take a little more time, but the visit was tremendously successful. Many thanks to Mr. Anderson, who was our, our accreditation chair, and all of our teachers, all of you. It was a huge school community effort. Uh, one, of the thing, one of the reasons, honestly, we don't care about accreditation that much. Uh, it really doesn't, it doesn't change our curriculum. We, we've, we told, you know, the association right up front, if this is going to cause us to compromise our mission, our standards, our values, our curriculum, we don't need it. And they said it won't. Uh, we do have some best practices that we want all of our schools to rise to. Here's why accreditation is important for us. First of all, it does provide transferable credit for students that come here. So it, it helps people to feel confident in enrolling that if they don't like it, they can transfer those credits somewhere else, okay? That's good, that's helpful, but we don't need it. Uh, one of the other things that's good and helpful, take a look at this map. It turns out that our accreditation is actually more important for our home and distance education families. This is a regulatory map of home schools. Green means low regulations. Pretty free to do what you want at home, parents. Yellow means moderately regulated. Brown means even more regulated, getting to the point where the state says you have to have you know, a certified teacher as a mom. And red is highly regulated, meaning you have to use state curriculum in your home, you have to have a certified teacher in your home, and so the trend, of course, in the United States is towards more regulation of home schools. Well, the good thing about accreditation is many of these families are finding that they can use American Heritage School curriculum and check that box with their state as being compliant because we are nationally accredited. 
So it turns out accreditation actually matters more for many of our homeschool families. Like I said, we're talking about approximately 400 families, 900 students right now. And so it is important for us to move forward with that process. It doesn't matter to colleges at all, it turns out. So this isn't about getting into college. This isn't really about our curriculum. This is more about making sure we are doing everything we can to have every benefit and every advantage for our mission at, uh, possible. OK, security and child protection. We are increasing the number of CCTV cameras that we have in the school. Uh, this, is not, this is not Big Brother. This is being wise and prudent. The temple has lots more cameras than we do. Um, we don't actively monitor. We passively monitor. If something happens, we can, we can look. We can check. Um, we do annual and ongoing employee training for emergency preparedness. For the first time, we did lockdown training with our teachers this summer with local law enforcement and our security personnel. If we do that with students, we will let you know in advance. Make sure that you're prepared for that. Uh, local law enforcement is recommending that schools do this now in the wake of Sandy Hook and some other things. Our safety and security committee, which has many experienced security officers, law enforcement officers, emergency preparedness officials, school officials, they will help us to determine exactly how we're going to go about that at American Heritage School. Um, we do regular background checks. We watch the air quality for you and let you know when we have to have some indoor recess. Uh, and carpool safety, one of the things that is in this letter here is please, please do not park next to red curbs or stop next to red curbs. We've added some yellow curbs so you know where you can load and unload. And that's okay. You can stop next to yellow curbs for unloading and loading during carpool, you know, parent service, things like that. But don't stop or park next to a red curb. Okay? Uh, all right. I think enough on that. Why don't we go ahead to our history presentation? Are we going to start with Janet, Stan? Okay. Dr. Janet Erickson. Where is Janet? She has been a member of our Board of Trustees for the past four years. She just finished her term. Uh, she's been a professor at BYU. I think she's still doing that in, in the Department of Family Science. And she's also an alumna of the school, uh, our first alumna who, who returned to be a member of our Board of Trustees. Let's welcome Dr. Janet Erickson. And I'll go ahead and introduce Stan as well. Stan Swim. Uh, the oldest son of Gaylord and Laurie Swim is the president of the GFC Foundation, which is one of the, well, which is the largest uh, financial supporter of the school. Uh, and so this family is invested both heart, soul, and wallet in a major way in this school, and we're grateful for them and their family through the years. Both of these families, uh, Janet's a descendant of the Anderson family, Verlin and Shirley Anderson, and you'll hear more from them. Thank you, Dr. Erickson and Stan. Thank you. It's an honor to be here tonight. I was thinking as you were hearing so much information, I hope your brains are better than my brain. I, that's a lot of things to take in in one hour. And hopefully in the next few minutes you can relax as you hear a little bit of the story of the history of this school. Stan and I have talked a little bit about why we share this story and, and why it matters. And I think it matters because each of you matters so much. The history of this school is filled with two beautiful principles, one being that every person who comes is guided here for some reason or another to build and strengthen the school and to build and strengthen their own faith and the faith of their children. And the second principle is that people who have come, every person who comes, is invited to give what they can, that this is a, a mission of sacrifice with the promise of great blessings as a reward. And you'll hear that as you hear this first part of the story. You will remember that Carl Mazur was given a mandate by Brigham Young to teach not even the multiplication tables without the Spirit of the Lord there. And that was the only instruction that Brigham Young gave him when he came in and asked him to found an academy. He gave him that and another sentence to teach not nothing without the Spirit of the Lord. And it transformed Carl Mazur. He became a different man with that mandate and went to Provo and through great sacrifice of himself and all of the people who worked with him, they were able to lay the foundation of church education, of gospel education in the church. 
And of course, that went on for a while through much fire and sacrifice, and including the founding of a school that was not college level, but was K through 12. My mom attended that school. Many of the professors at BYU, including my grandfather, had their children attend BYU Academy because they wanted their children who were younger to also grow up hearing the truth of the gospel in the midst of their academic learning. But in 1968, Ernest Wilkinson announced that being directed, of course, by the church itself, that it was not the highest priority and would be closed. And a group of those professors who had students got together and were anxious about this. What will then happen to our own children, the rest of our children, in being educated? And so there was clearly, for them, a need for a school grounded in the truths of the restored gospel. So my grandfather, Grandpa, I'll call him for throughout the rest of this, he met with a group of other BYU faculty, and they discussed the intent of starting a school with this particular mission, that they would have a school where their children could develop faith in God and a love of liberty and patriotism. In order to do this, they knew that they needed to have the scriptures laid at the foundation of all learning. And that would require a different place, a special place, and special teachers. At the same time, they recognized <clears throat> that they needed to find a building and all kinds of other things, and that none of them, being professors at BYU, had any money. I know what that's like, being a professor at BYU myself. <laughs> and so it was going to require help from, from heaven. And indeed, help from heaven came. President Benson, Elder Benson at the time, came to them and said, <clears throat> came to my grandfather and said, we have a building that's come up, a church, an old church building, and it's available if you would like to buy it for this school. And Grandpa said, we've got enough for a down payment, a small down payment, and we would like to have that building. It was a very old building and a precious building. And so they began in, in those early years, they're in that building trying to start and carry on this great new mission that they had. The mission that they outlined was that this school was established for the purpose of teaching faith in God and obedience to his commandments. Grandpa further wrote, every other purpose is secondary to this. Therefore, we would encourage each teacher to constantly bear this in mind as you prepare for and teach each, each subject. Incorporate into your lesson materials the teachings of the scriptures and the prophets. Draw freely from the fountain of truth and righteousness. This is the knowledge the Lord desires all of us to learn. They gave the name of the school American Heritage. Why? Because they recognize that we as Americans have a heritage, and all who come at any point in its history have, are also given this beautiful heritage that is unique in the world, one of religious liberty, one of a history that has been blessed by providence, that Washington spoke so often of, one of a nation that has had a belief in right and wrong, in moral right and moral wrong, one in, of Christian character and a, a nation where education had been grounded in morality. So then, as they started, they realized they had to get books. My grandmother's sister, who had taught school in Phoenix, Arizona, in the public school system for a long, long time, called her and said, the Phoenix School District is throwing out all of these books because they're too old and they have, they have funding to get more books. Do you want them? They're going to be placed in this landfill and you are welcome to go get them if you want them. Grandpa got a truck with a trailer on the back, drove down to Phoenix, Arizona, and he and Grandma loaded books from that landfill into, this, into the back of this trailer and brought it back, sorted through them, and placed them in the school. Of course, the teachers and staff couldn't be paid, paid very much. They knew when they were hired that they were going to be paid only what was left over after everything else had been taken care of. But it wasn't a deterrent somehow that wasn't a deterrent. And of course, those teachers were blessed to have other people help provide for their families in many cases. But they gave great sacrifice, just as the teachers here today do. And their sacrifice is planted in all of us who attended a love for the school because we saw a witness sacrificing for it and a love for the truths that they taught. In 1972, a, few, a couple of years after the school had started, the Spirit of America Speaks, the patriotic program as it was known then, was commissioned. And that then began, began a long legacy that has continued to this day of every year we would all participate in this story of liberty from the beginning of time, 
pre-earth life until now and into the future in preparation for the Lord's second coming. At the end of one of those performances, a Mrs. Green, who did not have children or grandchildren at the school, came up to my grandfather and asked what she could do. She had been so inspired by the beautiful message and the faces of the children aflame with a love for liberty and for the gospel and wondered what she could do. He mentioned the mortgage kind of in jest. A week or so later, there came a check in the mail covering the exact amount for that mortgage, and they were able to pay that building off. And for years, of course, we enjoyed the benefits of having a building that was paid off, an old building, but a precious building born of sacrifice that belonged to us. Of course, you know the school song, that the children who come here are the children of liberty, that they learn from the past with the quest to become Christians, Christian in heart, Christian of character, and prepare in the last verse to prepare for Christ to come in all that they do. In 1999, <clears throat> after I had long graduated from, from, from American Heritage, my mom and I and a group of other women were invited to attend a training in Virginia at an academy, Stonebridge Academy, that was founded by the Foundation for American Christian Education. We'd heard that they had a very inspired approach and an inspiring curriculum. We didn't know much about it, we, but we went and we sat through the training. During the middle of the training, my mom leaned over to me and she said, this is what Grandpa always had in mind. He passed away in 1992 and I'm sure was part of guiding us to participate in that training. What was so remarkable about this unique approach, the Foundation for American Christian Education, is that they knew, they knew how to lay the scriptures at the foundation of every subject that was taught, mathematics, science, history, language arts, every area the scriptures were laid at the foundation and they showed us how, though they didn't have the fullness that we have in modern scripture and the restored gospel. We took the principles that they taught us and came home. And there starts the next chapter of the story in a sense that has a long history because when my, when my mom met with Stan's father, Gaylord Swim, who you know has given so much in his family to this school, then he was able to, to help her to understand that for many, many decades his family had been involved in supporting the Foundation for American Christian Education. And finally the two great pieces had come together to give you what the school now has. Thank you, Janet. Janet and I have known each other for many years. Do we dare say how many? Probably not. Um, and I'm very thankful for the way that she has told the story of the school up to the point, up to 1999. I'm going to have to back up a little bit before that. I'll tell you some of the story. Um, we only have a few minutes, and there are many more people that deserve credit in this story than either of us have time. Uh, to be able to do justice to, but we'll, I'll only say that their sacrifices and their contributions cannot be forgotten. The seeds for our family's involvement were laid at BYU, where as a 19-year-old convert to the church in 1968, my dad encountered a religion professor named Reed Bankhead and a business law professor named Verlin Anderson. Grandpa Bankhead, it's not the only thing he got from but the Bankhead, it turns out. Grandpa Bankhead helped Dad become a student of the gospel and gave him an understanding of agency and freedom that integrated philosophy, religion, and politics. Professor Anderson taught Dad about the principles of the American founding and laid the early planks of Dad's legal understanding. Dad subsequently served a mission to Germany <clears throat> and came back to BYU for graduate study. By the time he finished a master's degree in political science and constitutional law, America's fundamentals had become his fundamentals, and he devoted much of his life to teaching and defending them in the public square. That's not exactly where the family started. Dad's great-grandfather, Henry Jackson Swim, was on the early faculty of what is now the University of Washington, and he was a Christian communist. Silence, yeah. <laughs> He left quite an impression on those around him, 
Though his obituary leads one to believe he wasn't necessarily persuasive. Here's the obituary. Imagine if this were said about any one of you. Death closed the career of Professor H.J. Swim of Linden on Saturday, November 7th, and his remains were laid to rest on the 9th. The deceased was a gentleman of fine education and possessed many lovable qualities. These will be remembered by a large circle of acquaintances, however much they disagreed with his political trend. Always sincere and always an extremist, he drew from life very little of contentment and mental repose. That's an obituary now. <laughs> he was too impulsive for leadership and too exacting for compromises, and therefore his social position never gained much strength. They're not finished. <laughs> he was a man too full of oil and too slim of wick to make a flaming beacon. His being carried on a stretcher to the polling booth three days before his death to vote for the progressive presidential can candidate William Jennings Bryan was a pathetic evidence of, his devo of devotion to his convictions. Never our friend, nor yet our enemy, hail and farewell. Close quote. <laughs> Henry's posterity took a very different view of American ideals than he did. Dad's father, Dudley, my grandfather, served as a naval officer in World War II, was national vice commander of the American Legion, and was as energetic a believer in freedom as Henry had been in communism. Dudley was appalled by what progressivism and the New Deal had done to American ideals, and he put his own energy and resources into challenging those things. Over the following decades, he and his wife Kay worked with a number of other people and organizations, including the Claremont College, Stanford University, Hillsdale College, Rockford College, the Foundation for Economic Education, and the American Enterprise Institute. Some of you may recognize all of these as names that are very much a force in uh, intellectual debate today. But the 1960s made clear that talking to grown-ups just wasn't enough. Elementary education became a concern, and it was about at this time in the late 60s that Kay formed a friendship with Verna Hall, the founder of Foundation for American Christian Education, who lived nearby in San Francisco. Dudley and Kay supported FACE's efforts to acquire some of the materials that made their way into the red books and the blue books that you see in classrooms throughout this building. Those volumes were on my sh dad's bookshelves as I was growing up and were among his first resources when talking about America. When mom and dad enrolled my two youngest sisters at American Heritage in the early 90s, things began to converge. Dad served as ten for 10 years as chairman of the board here, during which time the FACE curriculum was adopted and the first stage of this new campus was built, among many other developments. But Dad was not just interested in building a school. And it may seem like a matter of some triviality, but the name of the school isn't just American Heritage School. It's American Heritage Schools and Family Education Center. It's very deliberate that that's the case. Dad wanted this to be a community where parents and children learn together. Now, if I may, just talk about a few of the principles and ideas that drove Dad's part of the story, and I believe very much so also the Anderson portion of the story. Um, the more detail you look at in this particular history, the more commonality and harmony I think you find. And that's one of the, the great witnesses to me of, of the, the inspiration in the story. This is truly a mission-driven school. It is not a market-driven school. In one sentence, its mission is to play a scholastic role in Christ's plan for children and families. How we understand and fill that role does change and hopefully improve with time and prayerful consideration. Whereas earlier curriculum here, Abeka for example, was essentially secular with a spiritual overlay, the face methodologies and curriculum have been adopted because they are Christian from the bottom up. Yet even face methods and principles, as Janet indicated, improve and benefit from what we learn from the restored gospel. As another example of what has changed, for many years the students here at the school did not wear a uniform. Today's uniform 
really isn't about the clothes. What it is is an effort to teach promise keeping. It is a tool for increasing unity and a tutor in modesty and respect. Living our mission at the school for these 40 years, we've moved away from emphasizing governments made by men, although one should study them, to emphasizing the government within each man or woman. And this is what we mean by the self-government that you see over one of our doorways. This is why the restored gospel of Christ must be central to our teaching. It reconciles man's fallen nature and divine heritage through the atonement of Christ. People who govern themselves by Christ's law are at once the most governable and naturally free people anywhere. Educating hearts and minds is a phrase that is easily turned into a cliché. But here we mean this very specific task of helping children build their characters on the rock of Christ while preparing their minds and bodies to carry out whatever mission they may have in this mortal world. Now we all just chuckled when we read Henry Jackson Swim's obituary. But as part of my family's story, I believe it teaches some important lessons. We need the gospel as an anchor, not just on Sunday, but every day. It should shape not just what we believe, not just what we think, but how we act. It should be comprehensive. Next, we can limit our own usefulness to the Lord when what he needs are bright lights and flaming beacons and leaders of Christian influence in today's increasingly nihilist and secular world. I believe Henry's influence was constrained because he thought too much about governments made by men rather than the government within each man. That may have misordered his principles and it certainly limited his usefulness. Emphasizing civil government by advocating communism or by hyper-focusing on constitutional principles more than focusing on Christian self-government leads straight to pride. It also breeds a counterproductive cynicism about civil government and even other people generally. We've all seen examples of this and might even find some in our own conduct. The shared vision of Verlin Anderson and Gaylord Swim, both of whom wrote politically but ultimately focused more on the heart, should lead us down a path of true education as students and families because their shared vision was simply an invitation to find Christ in every aspect of our learning. This is why American heritage exists as it does today. And I hope it's what brought you and your family here. I know it's what I hope my sons experience when they start fourth grade and kindergarten next week. I'm confident that they will. We've talked a little bit about the sacrifice that it takes to build and operate something like this, and I'd like to close just with a quick thought in that vein. Today we often hear the, the phrase, pay it forward, as an encouragement to make a deposit of resources or service that will benefit others yet to come. You could say that Verlin Anderson and Gaylord Swim and both of their families have paid it forward, but I'd like to use a different word that has much more meaning for me and I hope will serve as an invitation to each of you. Both of these men and their families acted in terms of heritage, meaning they gave of themselves to establish something that would grow after them. That takes a lot of selfless work. Our society is much more comfortable with heritage's selfish opposite. That is a mortgage, literally the debt that will survive you. The boundary between mortgage on the one hand and heritage on the other, the dividing line, is the point of consumption. If your family comes here, pays tuition, fills the minimum service hours, we are glad to have you. But that's consumption. What would it take to get to heritage? we invite you and your whole family to drink deeply of this experience, not just individually, not 
as a student who may come here and then go home to whatever else they may find, but drink of this experience deeply and together. Share the content and the service. Be an active part of the school community. Give some thought and prayer to how you might add to that heritage. It will be different for every person. In nature, in magnitude, none of that makes a difference. The essential point is the attitude and the difference that drives us to do just a little bit more for the right reasons than doing just the minimum because that's what we think is required. I know that there are people in this room who already do this whom we haven't discussed tonight. And to each of you, I express profound thanks. Whatever has already been done, let's keep looking for ways to lift where we stand. Come through these doors one morning and you'll probably hear Mr. Beckwith inviting students to make this your best day yet. I'd like to think Verlin Anderson and Gaylord Swim would greet each of us with that same cheerful challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Stan and Janet. Okay, uh, we are just gonna conclude tonight um, by helping you to understand some priorities that we have as a school community together. And before we do that, I just wanna make a case to you. Our board has talked about this case a lot. Our development committee has talked about this case. This is the case for American heritage. And I'm just gonna use some lines to show you some graphs. This is the percentage of all Americans who report that they are leaving organized religion, about 16% currently. You can see the graph over the last 50 years. This breaks that down by age group. Look at this group at the top. This, this line on the top is age 18 to 29. One in three of them are leaving organized religion. This is the graph showing the number of marriages per 1,000 unmarried women age 15 and older over the last 50 years. And related to that is the number of cohabiting unmarried adult couples of the opposite sex over the last 50 years. There's the divorce rate, pretty consistent at about 50% since 1978. This is a very interesting one. The percentage of high school seniors who said having a child without being married is experimenting with a worthwhile lifestyle or not affecting anyone else over the last approximately 50 years. No, about 40 years, okay? That's, oh, that's almost 60% if you can see that, where that is. Utah Department of Drug and Alcohol Prevention and Treatment concluded the top three risk factors for drug-related teen deaths and suicides in one of the largest Utah public high schools, which is in Utah County, are, number one, depressive symptoms. That's 30% of the students in the school. Two, low commitment to school. That's 40% of the students in the school reporting on a survey that they're taking. That's higher than the county as a whole and higher than the state as a whole. And number three, and this is an interesting one, parental attitudes that are indifferent or favorable to antisocial behaviors exhibited by their children. 45% based upon this survey done in this school. Same study concluded that of all prevention techniques, including awareness programs, maintaining open lines of communication with at-risk teens, the protective factor that had the highest correlation with reducing antisocial behaviors was religiosity a very interesting and telling empirical conclusion. Why aren't we talking about religion a little bit more, at least in the public square, if it really is in the public interest of our children? Well, American heritage stands for the proposition that we can make a difference in these trends. Take a look at how many families are taking advantage of American heritage school just around well, this, so this is Utah County and South Salt Lake County, north of the point of the mountain. 
Here's the United States. And there's the world. We said about 1,000 students, 48 states, 23 countries. The case that we're trying to make is not just that this is a, a good school for your children in American Fork. The case that we're trying to make is that American Heritage School changes and saves lives. And that it's important even in LDS communities. It's also important in non-LDS communities if it really changes and saves lives. Okay. So what do we need if that's our case? Stan talked about a principle of sacrifice. Well, here are some strategies associated to that principle. Our goal for this year is $600,000 fundraising. Last year, we raised over $525,000 together. We did that, a half a million dollars. Thank you. Better than we have ever done before. We're trying to do these three things this year. With, with retirement benefits for our teachers, they receive very little of that now. We can attract and maintain exceptional teachers, which we already have, but we need to do better for them. We can invest in distance education more, which of course is part of our worldwide mission. And for every dollar donated to the distance education program, it nets two for the mission. It is a very high profit margin Stan said it just right. We are not a market-driven school. We are a mission-driven school. But there's no getting around the fact that it takes resources to propel, protect, and promote a mission. Distance education is doing that in a lot of different ways. And then putting some cash back in reserves. We've been using our reserves for the last five years to build capacity so that many of you and we can be here and to invest in our teachers our people, our distance education program. We have used that money that was donated, and now we want to put it back. So these are our goals this year, our strategic plan. Now, just a few priorities and we'll close. We just talked about the urgency for our mission and the solution which American Heritage supplies. Um, First of all, we're going to four priorities this year. They're actually not changing from last year. So if you were here last year, you're thinking this is deja vu. Well, it is a little bit with some slightly new strategies within it. The first priority is establish firm foundations. We talked a lot with our teachers about anchors and helms. This is Ether 12.4, Doctrine and Covenants, section 123.16. Faith maketh an anchor to the souls of men. And in DNC 123.16, helms, a very large ship is benefited very much by a small helm in the time of a storm, by being kept workways with the wind and the waves. Anchors and helms. What are we going to do to establish those foundational anchors and helms? This year, we're, last year we focused on devotionals in every class. We built those out. Parent foundations, we focused on that. Many of you did that. Watch the videos. We did student foundations, not just at the beginning of the year, but throughout the year in our classes. We did face training and sent our teachers to Stonebridge, brought that you know, information back. That was last year in the foundation's priority. This year, we are going to celebrate the thing that most of you experience the mission through most. And when I talk to you in my office, most of you say, this is what we love about American Heritage School. We hear this around our dinner table. Memorizations and stories, particularly stories that come from his story. So this year in Foundations, we are going to celebrate memorizations and the stories that are told because it's part of our foundation. It's who we are. That's foundations, anchors, helms, and, 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 and celebrating those memorizations and stories. Number two, reduce and simplify. We talked about this last year. This isn't just about the calculus of growth. It's about the calculus of subtraction as well. It's so hard to subtract when an institution is growing. 
but it's the mark of every good and wise steward of a mission. What can we get rid of that is not essential? This year, we are eliminating ITBS testing in kindergarten through eight, in kindergarten through eighth grade. Those were our paper-based standardized tests that took two weeks out of our school year. Our curriculum committee has looked far and wide to find a very good substitute that will be, that will take less time, that will provide us immediate feedback that's usable, and that will focus just on reading and math the two competencies that we really feel like we need to do standardized testing with. And we've identified computer adaptive assessment called STAR. You're going to hear more about that this year. Please be patient with us. Those tests will be done in hours versus weeks. And you'll get reports within hours versus at the summer when it's a post-mortem kind of thing. Uh, so you're going to hear more about STAR, but, but we're going to, you know, it'll be a bit of a learning curve for us as we do it, but it will bless our mission in the sense of reducing and simplifying, even as we innovate, okay? Also, in the category of reducing and simplifying, we will be reducing the scope of the experiential learning program that we announced in the spring. It is possible that we will not hold the experiential learning program at all. What we know right now is that there are enough concerns from teachers, administrators, and some board members that we need to cancel and have canceled the previously announced Tonga service learning experience and also the California Monterey Bay Research Institute service or experiential learning course. We're trying to, if we're going to do this program, we're going to make it local and affordable. So again, in the spirit of reducing and simplifying, you're going to hear more. Uh, we approved those trips. We know that some students, a handful, at least a half dozen, have worked all summer to save money for those trips. And we sincerely apologize for this change in direction. But please understand that we feel it's the right thing to do. And. Rob Swenson, the director who, of our music programs, who was going to take, he did a lot of work planning an incredible experience in Tonga. It was set. Can you imagine his feelings when we said, we're not going to do this? He was a king about the whole thing. He was so graceful, so gracious, so supportive, even as he made his case about why we should still do it and agreed that we would discontinue this for the reasons that we will. Now, we're going to have to explain this to students. They need to understand the why. And that why is all bound up in this case that we're trying to make about reducing and simplifying, staying focused on what matters most. So we'll have more information for you on experiential learning week in January. This is just applies to 7th through 12th grade, not elementary. The whole concept of experiential learning is... Tell me and I will remember for a day. Show me, I'll remember for a week. Let me do and I will remember for a lifetime. So it's an important concept, but how we do it is important to our mission. Okay, that's reduce and simplify. Number three, grow incrementally, not exponentially. Last year, we made a very important decision to grow without debt, even though we had huge demand indicators for the school. My, uh, my hat is off to the board. Tough decisions, right, Curtis? Over the last five years, not to use debt financing. I am very happy to report that this year, after five years of investing, spending more than we were charging in tuition to grow our capacity, pay our teachers better, this year, for the first time, the plan will be operationally profitable. The school will be. So will the distance education program. We're already seeing that. Nearly a quarter of a million dollars in sales since May. That's very exciting. Our enrollment is growing, but we're incrementally, yeah, thank you. A lot of hard work, a lot of late nights. But that blesses everything that's happening here as well. Incremental growth also meant for us last year, and it means the same thing for us this year, growing our enrollment on campus carefully. 
Even though we could grow faster, we decided not to add another seventh grade last year. That was also a hard board decision, but an important one. So we are only growing by approximately 25 students this year as opposed to 50 to 75 that we could have grown by had we added classes where we have waiting lists, including in seventh and eighth grade. But that incremental growth helps to preserve our focus. Okay, and then last of all, I have to mention one more thing on enrollment. Two years ago, we dismissed 14 students from the school, mostly in 7th through 12th grade. Those were expulsions for reasons related to lack of commitment to the honor code or lack of commitment to our academic expectations. Last year, it was about half of that. And this coming year, we hope it will be half again. But again, that careful, cautious approach to who we admit and who we keep is very important to our mission. Okay, last one. Enjoy the ride. This is number four, focus number four. Enjoy the ride. It goes so fast. And it ends sooner than we thought it would. The bumps and the turns are all part of the joy. Just ask, just ask the Norton family, ask the Howard family, how fast it goes. And for us to enjoy the ride, it takes celebrating the process, not just the intended outcomes. So here's the last focus we're gonna have this year, which is focusing on consistency. And I want you to watch something from Elder Bednar because this has everything to do with our homes and this strategic focus on enjoying and celebrating the ride, the process, the consistency, okay? and concerned at home as we bear testimony and consistently live it. Suggestion number three, be consistent. As our sons were growing up, our family did what you have done and what you now do. We had regular family prayer, scripture study, and family home evening. Now, I am sure what I am about to describe has never occurred in your home but it certainly did in ours. Sometimes Sister Bednar and I wondered if our efforts to do these spiritually essential things were worthwhile. Now and then verses of scripture were read amid outbursts such as, he's touching me. <laughs> Make him stop looking at me. <laughs> Mom, he's breathing my air. It must have happened in your home if you're laughing. <laughs> Sincere prayers occasionally were interrupted with giggling and poking. And with active, rambunctious boys, family home evening lessons did not always produce high levels of edification. At times, Sister Bednar and I were exasperated because the righteous habits we worked so hard to foster did not seem to yield immediately the spiritual results we wanted and expected. Today, if you could ask our adult sons what they remember about family prayer, scripture study, and family home evening, I believe I know how they would answer. They likely would not identify a particular prayer or a specific instance of scripture study or an especially meaningful family home evening lesson as the defining moment in their spiritual development. What they would say they remember is that as a family, we were consistent. Sister Bednar and I thought helping our sons understand the content of a particular lesson or a specific scripture was the ultimate outcome. But such a result does not occur each time we study or pray or learn together. The consistency of our intent and work was perhaps the greatest lesson, a lesson we did not fully appreciate at the time. In my office is a beautiful painting of a wheat field. The painting is a vast Thank you, Melanie and Greg. Well, welcome to American Heritage. These are going to be some of our strategic focuses this year, and we need your help. 
Uh, we love and appreciate each of you. We know that each of you are lifting where you stand and you're fighting hard battles in your home. We're going to do that together at American Heritage in our classrooms, in our home, and in our churches. The three great institutions that we desire to combine here. Thank you for being here. We're going to have a closing prayer uh, which will be offered by Vicki Lofgreen, following which, if you want to ask any questions, I know we covered a lot. We'll just do an open mic. Um, we look forward to seeing you all. You're welcome to come on the first day of school for our cannon fire. That's always a great experience. Vicki, and then we'll do a question and answer. Our dear Heavenly Father, as we come before thee to thank thee for the opportunity that we've had to attend this meeting, that we pray that we as parents, that we will strive to teach our kids about the importance of coming to American Heritage and to always honor and serve. We pray that we will be good examples to them and that we will teach with all of our heart and our minds that we will strive to help them have a good school year. We pray that we will do things consistently, that we will be blessed for our efforts. And we say these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, Greg, can we turn this one on? How about that? Does that do it? Okay, floor's yours. Questions, comments? I was going to bring some rotten tomatoes for you to throw at me when I announced we were canceling Tonga on California trip. Yes, Mrs. Yule. Yes, please. Okay. Although I agree that changing to a different assessment from the ITBS to one that will take less time, and I'm concerned what you are going, how you're going to assess science and social sciences. So we as parents know what their levels are. So in kindergarten through seventh grade, science, social studies, all of those will still be assessed through our internal assessments, report cards. Starting in eighth grade, we do high stakes testing with those subjects such as the, the ACT Explore test, which all of the eighth graders take, and then the ACT plan in ninth grade, then pre-ACT, ACT. So we start all of that. In kindergarten through seventh grade, we just made a decision as a curriculum committee that our scores on the, the national norm reference tests in social studies and science were consistently in the 85th to 100th you know, percentile. We just didn't feel like it was so important to keep spending two weeks telling ourselves that we're doing just fine in social studies and science. It's reading and math, the two core competencies that really produce success in those subjects when you get to the high stakes testing. So that was the basic rationale of the curriculum committee. We may have some curriculum committee members here who want to add to that. Okay, good question. Yeah, I know. Okay, other questions? Yes. Mrs. Christiansen. The meeting next week, that's Wednesday night for parents, they didn't mention the time, and in the um, admission paperwork, it said 5 to 6, 6 to 7, 7 to 8. What's that? From 5 to 6 o'clock will be an introduction to all of the specialty classes. So you actually sit in one room and you listen to this parade of teachers say, here's music and here's um, you know athletics and here's all this. And then from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock, you have three repeating sessions in the core classrooms. So from 6 to 6.50, you can go to your third grade class, for example, hear that class's orientation. Then you can go to your seventh grade class, and they'll repeat it every hour. Does that make sense? That's how the classroom parent orientation works. OK, good question. Other questions? Yes. One of our concerns with Common Core was the computer adaptive testing. And is this test, the adaptive testing that American Heritage has, um, the, are the questions available for parents? 
Good question. So are the questions available for parents? If they're not, we'll make them. We have nothing to hide. And STAR testing, um, which is a nationally, it's a national database of questions. It's got lots of diagnostics built into it so we can norm right away with how our students are performing. It does include questions that they have said will fit for, for Common Core. We want to emphasize to everyone that we're using this and not in order to satisfy a Common Core requirement. We don't care about Common Core. It will never change our curriculum. The national norm reference test that we use will never change our curriculum. It's only for the purpose of our trying to get some kind of benchmark indicator of where our children are versus other children in the United States. Whereas in other schools that have common core requirements, they actually teach to the test. So if they're taking a test that has common core questions, they're building those questions into their curriculum. That's not us. We don't, we don't care what's on the test in terms of how we build our curriculum. Our curriculum actually looks a lot different than the test, especially in history and social studies. I mean, um, so does that answer your question? Okay, good question. Is it Mr. Christiansen? Were you? Jolly, Mr. Jolly. Okay, good. Other questions? Easy night. Getting out of here without joke. Okay. Very good. Signing off over and out. <laughs>